In this episode, I talk about how I use my special occasion inks, I give a comparison between the Pilot Custom 74 and the Pilot Vanishing Point, and I talk about the future of online retail. Hey there folks, it's Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and this is episode number 145 of Goulet Q&A. It has been an eventful week. Um, we did have the election this week and that's about all I'm going to say about it because you're hearing about it just about everywhere else, but that is something that has happened. Uh, we have our thanks giveaway contest going on right now, which is going strong, getting some good entries in, some really cool stuff. One thing that we're doing differently this year internally is as entries are being submitted, we're cataloging them all and making sure that they're all good. We're actually sharing them with everybody on our team, so our folks are going to get to see your letters throughout the month, and it's uh, everybody in our company is going to be able to connect to it. So it's really kind of cool, kind of a cool thing that we're doing this year. It's a really nice uh, thing that we get to do. So if you haven't checked that out yet, um, um, try to get your entry in before November 23rd because that's going to be the end of the contest. So be aware of that. We also are going to be having a um, chili cook-off this weekend. It's for Goulet team members. Um, we're going to be hosting a chili cook-off for our team this weekend. So a nice little camaraderie building thing, uh, a little bonfire, s'mores, all that stuff. Have a bouncy house for the kids. It should be nice and fun. Cool little culture building thing. Um, we are having something that's uh, new that we're trying here that uh, you may or may not have seen already, but it's a new style of video that we're doing called Quick Tips. So essentially, this is an idea that came up through our customer care team. Uh, and Drew, who's our customer care manager, has helped and worked with Jenny to uh, produce our first one of these videos, which is a video on uh, assembling a Twisby pen. So I did a video a long time ago on it, and Drew wanted a really short one, so it's only a minute long very instructional no talking or anything like that so just kind of a new style of video that we feel is kind of more you know um, I guess accepted these days back in the five years ago when I was doing these videos I would just turn on the camera and shoot a 22 minute video on how to disassemble a pen and that was cool but now everybody's got phones and we all have lives uh, so sometimes we want a shorter video. Um, so this is a new thing that we're trying out. We have some other ones uh, kind of planned out. These are just quick instructional kind of things to make troubleshooting and stuff like that a little bit easier for you. So love some feedback on that. Uh, if you have any ideas for cool videos too, we'd always, always want to hear from you guys about the best way that we can serve you. So look out for that. Um, got you know some new products we've had uh, we're slowing down intentionally the new products a little bit because this is a kind of our crazy time and so we are being really intentional right now uh, just internally uh, about what's going on um, we got you know different things we have our um, uh, our media team manager Margaret who uh, just recently had her baby uh, so that's really exciting she's on maternity leave right now so we're having to plan out uh, our media stuff uh, more intentionally now um, in her absence uh, and so uh, also we have um, some other folks that have some major life events going on that I'm failing to mention right now because I didn't actually talk to them ahead of time to make sure it's cool to say it on video but um, we got some other team members that got some life stuff going on some good stuff um, so I am uh, you know, just having to slow down just a little bit here, um, and that's okay. But uh, we do have some new products that are coming out, uh, one of them being the Lamy package set, so uh, gift set. So this is actually a gift box that the presentation is pretty nice, um, and it's uh, it's something that we've had for the last couple of years. They brought it back again this year. So it's a Lamy pen, which we got a couple different versions, but it's a Lamy pen with a bottle of ink, a pack of cartridges, and a converter, and a nice little set, discounted off of what you would pay for um, you know full price, and you get to uh, have a nice little presentation for the holiday season. So that's kind of cool. We got a bunch of those have launched. Um, also, we have the Lamy Scala, which we uh, have not had before. It comes in this nice box because it's a special edition. Um, but the Scala Glacier comes with a converter as it falls out of the box. Uh, it's got a bottle of ink, Lamy Blue, and then it's got a blue pen here, which is a nice matte blue finish. Uh, and the Scala is 
similar sort of in style to a studio. So if you're a fan of the studio, the Scala may be up your alley. Um, this is a special color that they have, and it's the 50th anniversary, so it actually has a Lamy 50 logo here on the cap, which is kind of cool. And then it has the 14 karat Lamy nib, which is just, to me, I just, I'm a huge fan of that nib. Um, so if this pen is to your liking, you can check it out on our site. Um, it's a little over $200, so it's not a super, super cheap pen, but if you are interested in it and you like the special edition stuff, there we go, um, it may be for you. So there's that, we have those now. It's the first time we've ever had the Scala on our site. Scala, Scala, not sure how it's pronounced actually. Uh, and then we're going to have the Twisby 580 all pink next week. They're in transit to us and we are gonna be launching them next week. So that's pretty exciting. Everybody's a big fan of the, the Twisby stuff there. I know Rachel's gonna be setting one aside with a broad nib for herself. Uh, it's already like on the docket there. Um, and then we'll have some other stuff coming out. I know we're going to have uh, knock brass towns coming out in a couple of colors or kind of getting them in as they're prepared, as they're ready for them. Uh, so just be on the lookout for that. And then we got some other things that are kind of coming down the pike. Um, I talked a lot last week about products that are coming and I'm just not going to mention them every single week, but that is kind of what we got going on. Cool. All right, for this week, um, you know what, I feel like I was supposed to mention something. Give me a quick second, sorry about this, but I was, I feel like I was supposed to mention something in the video today that I've just now forgotten about. Mm, okay. Never mind. Maybe I've forgotten something. Maybe I haven't. But either way, let's carry on, shall we? Let's get into the questions for this week. All right, so I got a good number of questions. Had a lot of good questions this week. It's tough to narrow them down, but I was able to do it. All right, uh, starting out with pen and writing questions. Uh, this is from Kevin G on Facebook. Kevin says, is there a fountain pen that's spin friendly? I've never been asked this question before. Uh, I subconsciously spin my pens like in my fingers, like this kind of thing, you know? And it's not the first time that I decorated my classmates' dresses with my favorite inks of the week. What feed design do you find keeps ink in the pen in general? Well, I honestly, I have not stress tested most pens in this way, um, but generally speaking, the drier the pen, the less it's gonna be flingable. I guess is that would be the right word. Um, and, and usually I would think the, the less of the nib and the feed that's exposed, the better off you're gonna be. In terms of feed design, if you have a feed where it has exposed fins like this, and you have a lot of ink that's gonna be kind of sitting there in those fins, these fins act kind of like a regulator, right? So it's like a sort of like a reservoir so that uh, it kind of fills up a little bit, and then as you're writing, if you're writing really fast, the ink is right there ready to go rather than having to draw all the way down through the pen, it kind of fills up in the, feet, in the fins there. Um, but uh, not all pens are designed the same way. There's definitely some pens that don't have that as much. Uh, one that comes to mind is something like the Pilot Vanishing Point. You know, it's just got this tiny little nib. It has a feed that's just this tiny little thing. It has no fins on it. So there's not really a lot of ink sitting out here. And I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> I did not get a lot of warning on that one. <laughs> it just creeped up on me. So this feed does not have a lot of ink that's just kind of sitting here out and exposed to the pen. Now granted, with a pen like this, you could click it, you know, and if you are uh, from my era and you remember the movie uh, GoldenEye, the 007 movie that came out when I was at a very impressionable age, um, you remember there was a scene, not with a fountain pen, but there was a scene at the end where Boris was spinning and clicking his pen, the pen that James Bond had that would had a grenade in it, um, and uh, that's whatever I think of when I think of spinning and clicking, I think of that movie. Anyway, that was a tangent. So vanishing point could certainly work a little on the pricey side to be spinning in case you drop it or something, uh, but it could help. You know, other, other things that could help in the feed design is if you have a pen that um, has a hooded nib. So I'm thinking specifically of like the Lamy 2000. Granted, this is a stainless version. You probably wouldn't be spinning this one, but still the concept is if you have kind of a, ho a hooded or a semi hooded nib, not much of the, the feed and nib is being exposed. Therefore spinning it, you would probably be uh, safer than with your typical fountain pen where, you know, something like this pen where there's a lot of the feed that's exposed. But honestly, it's gonna be a little bit hit or miss. You're kind of taking a calculated risk whenever you're spinning your pen with your nib exposed. So I would say if you can get a pen that has an easy way to kind of either retract the nib or cap it or something like that, then you can spin it while it's closed 
and then it would be a non-issue. That would be the route that I would go, personally. Specifically, I'm thinking like the Pilot Metropolitan. That's a pretty great spinning pen um, because it's not that expensive, so if you drop it, it's not a huge deal. But then you can uncap it, write with it real quick, cap it again, and then do it that way. So that's another option for you. Give it some thought, do whatever you like, but I thought it was interesting. Um, next question, this is from Adorkable on Instagram. Love the handle. I'm debating between a Pilot Custom 74 or a Vanishing Point. Either one with a fine nib. Any thoughts other than flipping a coin? Well, you could do that. Um, that's a tough one because you are um, talking about two really phenomenal pens and two of kind of some of my favorites. So it's no secret that my blue Custom 74 is kind of a, a, one of my favorite pens. It's very sentimental to me because it was my first gold nib pen. I wrote many of the earliest Goulet Pen Company handwritten notes with this pen. So I like it. It's also just a phenomenal writer. That said, the Vanishing Point, also a phenomenal writer. Now the feed and the nib design on these pens is very different. You know, this is more, the Custom 74 is more of a conventional nib and feed look. The Vanishing Point is the clickable one. So it's a very different size. But the actual writing experience with the two, believe it or not, is fairly similar. Um, the nibs are ground to be fairly, fairly the same, and uh, same tip size, and the springiness might be a little bit more on the Custom 74 because of the length of the nib, but really it's not too bad on the Vanishing Point either. Um, it doesn't spring back quite as, as easily as this one does, but it does get just a little bit of spring. Um, so if you wanted truly a springier uh, experience, it's not flexible, it's not, you're gonna get a line variation here, but to me this does feel just a little bit springier. Um, but really it's a great experience for both similar line width. Um, the ink capacity is going to be greater on the Custom 74 because it's got that big Con 70 converter in the back versus the, the, the conventional uh, converter on this one. So that's a little bit of a drawback for the Vanishing Point. Probably if there was one drawback that everybody would say, it's the ink capacity on that pen. But, you know, it's got a nib unit that's inside the pen, so it has, uh, you know, some space that has to be accounted for in there for that mechanism. But uh, all in all, it's really not uh, a huge issue. It's not like it makes the pen unusable, but that's it's definitely a, a little more of a plus for the for the Custom 74. Um, some other things that uh, each have going for it. Price-wise, they're fairly similar. It's a little bit more for the Custom 74. It's you know maybe fifteen twenty dollars more. It's, it's you know a consideration, but it's not a total deal breaker when you're talking pens in the hundred and fifty dollar price range. Um, uh, to me, I think some of the bigger deals is you get more nib size options with the Vanishing Point. So that's nice. You can get an extra fine, you can get a stub. That's not available, at least in the US, in the Custom 74. Uh, the other thing is the click retraction. That's a huge convenience factor over the screw cap on the Custom 74. So if you're jotting down notes and taking really quick notes here and there, the Vanishing Point is a little more practical. Um, and also the color options too. Now there's some decent color options on the Custom 74, uh, but the Vanishing Point has a lot bigger color range and you can get some even some fancy stuff like the, the rod and finishes and you know with the abalone shell and stuff, it's really, really gorgeous stuff. Um, that's gonna be more expensive, but it's still uh, pretty awesome that you get on the Vanishing Point. So um, all in all, I can't really say which one is gonna be the best for you. I honestly think if you, it's a complete and total toss up for you, you really could flip a coin and you'd be happy with either one and then just then save up some more and buy the other one uh, because you would be happy with both. But um, me personally, I have both. I end up using, actually using on a regular basis my Custom 74 a little bit more, but I can say like in terms of popularity and stuff like that, the Vanishing Point far outsells the Custom 74. I mean, there are Custom 74 is no slough, but the Vanishing Point is, is far and away a more popular pen. Um, so if for no other reason you're just looking for what are the greatest chances if, I, if you consider yourself to be someone who likes things that most other people like, um, the Vanishing Point would probably be more the way to go for you, but I'm very sentimental about Custom 74. So either way, you're not gonna go wrong. All right, this is uh, from Hello Matt Morrow on Instagram. Uh, and Mello Matt Morrow asks uh, a pretty decent length question, so bear with me. Uh, story time. A few years ago, my mom was in a car accident that shattered her writing arm. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, she recovered mostly, but writing was a strain with her muscles fighting against the plates holding her arm together. Recently, I bought her Alami All-Star, and it's made a world of difference. She doesn't have to squeeze the grip or press on the paper, so this pen effectively saved her handwriting. 
My question is, are there any other fountain pens that have an ergonomic grip similar to the All-Star where my mom wouldn't have to constantly readjust her hand position or have to squeeze it to keep it in place? Um, yes, there are definitely some pens that kind of fit in that range. Um, I had to pick some that I don't even carry, honestly, because um, some of the best pens that I think for this purpose are actually pens made for kids. So I, if, if your mom's not like offended by that or weirded out by that at all, um, the, some of the best pens are ones that are made for kids because of exactly that reason. They're made to be held in a certain way. Um, specifically, you know, you mentioned the Lamy All-Star. Certainly that could be there. Lamy All-Star Safari, the Vista, they all have that kind of triangular grip. They all work really well. Um, other pens, I'm thinking like the Pelican Twist. This isn't one I sell, but I have one and I'm familiar with it. It has a very distinct triangular grip. Um, comes in these very fun kind of primary colors. Uh, but there's really no way to hold this thing wrong because you are holding it on the triangle. Um, and it's very, uh, you know, it's got a rubbery grip. It's a big grip and it's got the triangle thing going on. So, and it's not super expensive either. This is a really good pen for anybody that is um, either just starting out learning how to write like a kid or um, somebody who is having to readjust writing or has arthritis or something like that. Um, anyone who has kind of physical uh, needs uh, for a pen like this could work really well. So that's one option. Um, another one, this is the Pelican Pelicano Jr. It's another kid pen. Now granted, this is their old design. Um, they, I think they've redesigned it since then, but same kind of idea. It's got kind of a rubbery, larger, triangular kind of grip thing. So you may want to check out uh, some of the Pelican pens that are out there. Um, I used to carry the, the Pelicano, actually, um, the Pelicano Jr. They really were not popular sellers for us. Um, for whatever reason, just really wasn't pop, like was re I mean really not popular. We sold like one or two pens a year. It just didn't sell a lot. Um, another one that I don't have on me, but is similar to this, is the Lamy ABC. So if your mother likes the way your Lamy nib writes, and you can actually swap the nibs in between it uh, with her All Star, is the Lamy ABC again? It's another kid pen, but it's got a bigger kind of rubbery grip. Another one that's uh, you know um, a little less of a you know, rubber grip kid pen kind of thing is a Pilot Kakuno. Now it's still kind of fun and geared towards a younger demographic, but um, it's a little more kind of a conventional looking pen. Uh, also has kind of a triangular uh, grip thing going on with it. And it's got a nib with a smiley face on it. It's really fun and happy. Uh, so that is kind of cool, nice option from Pilot there. And this is the one that I'm mentioning here that I actually sell. So <laughs> uh, that could be kind of, kind of uh, helpful there. Um, if you don't want to go the route of like a triangular grip kind of thing, because the most of the pens that have a very pronounced triangular grip tend to be a little more in the kid pen kind of uh, group, um, you may just want to go with a slightly larger pen. Um, so I'm thinking specifically something like the Conklin All-American. It's a larger pen, it's got a bigger grip, so, but it's light still, it's not really heavy. So it's not this huge heavy thing. So um, specifically for people that are you know, having uh, arthritis or you know, a writing surgery or something like that where uh, it's hard to, to hold a really thin pen, holding something bigger, something that's still light enough to where it doesn't weigh your hand down can be really good. Um, so this is an option, some, a few good color options. Um, so take a look at that. And if you want to go up a little bit more in price and style too, um, you can go to Edison. Uh, Edison Pens has a pen called the Collier, which is uh, one of the more popular styles of pens. Um, but it's a larger pen, uh, has a larger grip as well, and a big nib on it, and so uh, writes really nicely. So it might also be worth consideration if you want really kind of a more distinctive kind of grown-up pen. Um, those two might be really good options for you. Um, and lastly, I'll say that if you know your mom likes that Lamy, she can, we have a couple tools on our site that can help out. So one is called the Pen Plaza. So we've actually photographed pens in a very specific way to where they can be compared side by side. And every pen on our site you can compare in there. And we even have some pens in there that we don't carry anymore. Uh, but you can see specifically the pens that we have in there and how the grips uh, compare. So that could be a good way for her to kind of look through uh, and, and get an idea. Uh, and then another thing you can do is check the technical specifications under any given product page on our site. And you can see we have a grip diameter that we've actually measured. Now the triangular grips, it's kind of hard. What is the grip diameter of a triangular grip? Um, that gets kind of complicated um, in terms of practicality. What does it actually feel like? 
excuse me, but um, I can say just in general, going with a diameter that's you know nine to ten millimeters or more is going to be more the size that you're going to want for uh, a pen that's going to be more comfortable um, if you have any kind of like special needs in terms of your handwriting and stuff like that. So uh, you can definitely check that out. All right. Next question is from Robbie H on Facebook. I've been researching the Visconti Homo sapiens for months now, and today I came across your blog where you compare the Edison 18 karat nib and the Visconti 23 karat palladium dream touch. All it said was they were comparable or similar. Can you expand on this comparison? I am trying to decide if $500 plus is worth spending on the Visconti. <clears throat> okay. That's a great point. Um, it is definitely an investment. Either one of these pens is a significant investment. Um, so specifically about the Edison, so I, I just mentioned the Collier a second ago, but if you are looking uh, to get an Edison pen, they come with a stainless steel nib on them in around the $150 range uh, for their production line pens. You can buy a gold nib upgrade, so an 18 karat gold nib upgrade for this pen. Um, however, you're gonna pay for the pen and then you're gonna pay an upcharge for the nib, $125, to get that gold nib, because gold nibs are very expensive. Um, so you're gonna pay in the $275 range to get an Edison pen with an 18 karat nib on it. So um, it's not quite as much of a bargain, granted it is still like half the price of the Visconti, right? So if you are looking at the Visconti, you know, here I have, this is the Visconti Homo sapiens Dark Age, it has the palladium nib, granted it's got a black coating on it, but it's still the, the palladium nib. Um, and I find that in practicality, the palladium nib has a very similar feel to it as an 18 karat gold nib. Uh, I find that in terms of the springiness, in terms of the feedback, and in terms of its softness, that it feels very similar. Now, of course, it can be ground in different ways and all that stuff, but um, the actual metal itself has similar properties to gold. So that's part of where you know, my blog comparison was saying, yeah, it feels pretty similar. Now, granted, there's other things going on with the pens that affect the price and the features and stuff like that. Um, so with uh, the, the Edison pen, you're gonna be looking at a cartridge converter pen, which may be more to your liking, and that's fine. You can also take out the converter and you can convert it to an eyedropper pen. So a little silicone grease here, you can fill the body with ink, and then you have a nice large uh, ink reservoir. The Visconti has a power filler, as they like to call it, but uh, it's essentially a vacuum filler. So it's got this nice little uh, vacuum piston that goes up, you put it down in the ink, you push it down, and then it fills up with ink. So um, in terms of the actual ink capacity, you're gonna get a larger ink capacity, at least twice the ink capacity on this Homo sapiens than you will using the converter on the Edison. Now, if you're using a hydropper fill, you're gonna get more on this than you will on the Homo sapiens. Um, but you're gonna get a bigger ink capacity on this, plus um, it's made of lava rock, which is really just kind of cool. Um, and the nice thing about the lava rock here, aside from the fact that it's virtually indestructible, it's a very, very tough material. They basically pulverize the lava rock and then cast it in resin so that it is really, really tough stuff. Um, but it's also hygroscopic. And what that means is that it is going to uh, actually wick away moisture from your fingers as you're writing with it. So it's going to feel kind of more like ebonite. If you're familiar with ebonite, is the same way it's hygroscopic. Um, it's gonna feel uh, a little grippier, and it's not going to slip around in your hand as much uh, as if you have oily fingers like I do. It's not gonna slip around in your hand as much as a uh, resin would. So that's gonna be kind of a nice, a nice feature to have there. Another thing I really like about the Homo sapiens is that it has, um, the cap is called the hook safe lock. So it has these little grooves cut in here where there's five of them cut around the, the pen. And so you only have to rotate it one fifth of the pen to be able to take the cap off. So it's super easy to do. And it's got this nice little spring mechanism built into the cap that kind of locks it in place. So you just give it a fifth twist and then it locks it in there. So very secure, but also really easy to cap and uncap. I end up using the Homo sapiens uh, most often as my daily carry around these days. You know, it's got like a spring clip and it's got, you know, some robust trim and stuff like that. The Edison is more of a kind of a vintage design. 
The bottom line is you're both phenomenal pens and you're gonna get a great writing experience with both pens. It's just some of these other features that are gonna make the difference for you in terms of design, in terms of balance and weight and incapacity and all these other things. Um, but if you're really going for the best writing experience, best bang for your buck, the Edison is going to be the way to go for you because it's a phenomenal writing pen, especially with that 18 karat nib. Um, but that said, also, very few people regret buying Homo sapiens too. So uh, I think either way, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, sitting pretty once you actually make the commitment. All right, let's talk about some ink, shall we? This is from ddante03 on Instagram. Where are you using your ink colors like orange, purple, and brown? I'm about to buy a bottle of Sailor Apricot. I found some of them in a local shop, but I don't know where I can use it. I use blues, black, and red ink. And I have a bottle of brown ink, but I don't know where to use it too. Thanks for your help. <laughs> this is interesting to me why um, why I get a question like this. Uh, honestly, just use it wherever you want. Like, I don't know, I'm, I have a different perspective because I haven't worked a professional job before. <laughs> um, I did one internship at a college at a, um, a REIT, a real estate investment trust, uh, doing property management stuff. It was a six week internship and I was like, no way am I gonna wear a suit every day, forget this. Uh, and it's just, uh, here I am now, right? Look at me in my flannel glory. Uh, but no, for me, I've never been in a situation where it's been inappropriate for me to use any particular ink color. So it's literally been like whatever the heck I felt like using. I mean, now I can understand if you're like signing a lot of legal documents and stuff like that, there's only certain colors you can use or if you need to scan it or highlight it or something like, like scanning and faxing and stuff like that, certain colors is like don't, don't show up when you do that. That I get, okay, so I, you, you're probably in a situation like that where you need to use a certain color, at least I'm gonna assume that. Otherwise though, really man, it's just whatever makes you happy. Like there's so many cool colors and that's one of the most appealing things to me about um, fountain pens is the ability to use whatever ink color you want. Because there's so many different ones. We have over 500 colors. It kind of changes every day, but um, there's so many different colors uh, to choose from that uh, I say, why not just use whatever you feel like? That's why we offer ink samples. You can try out all kinds of crazy colors to be able to you know, experiment and broaden your horizons a little bit. Um, you might be surprised just how much you might fall in love with a random blue or green or something like that. Um, specifically your Sailor Apricot, that's a, I actually have that ink uh, over there. That's a, that's a discontinued ink that's not even made anymore. So if you really like that color, you definitely should pick that up at that shop if you haven't already uh, because it's not going to be around for much longer um, because they don't make it anymore. So uh, yeah, I would say I don't have any specific things for you other than um, you know if you are in a work environment where you're not able to use you know more fun colors and stuff like that, which I get that people are in that situation sometimes. Um, there's lots of times when you can use uh, ink you know for yourself on your own notes that you're taking. Uh, if you do any type of journaling or mind mapping or anything like that on your own, your own notes you're referencing. Um, if you want to do any correspondence or write letters to anybody stuff like that. That's an opportunity for you to do some cool stuff. And honestly, half the time when you're corresponding with somebody and you use a kind of a crazy colored ink, it really is more memorable for the person that's using it because you know, it really stands out to them. And it's like, wow, this, it feels more personal. And it really stands, as long as they can actually read what you're writing, you know what I mean? Uh, you don't wanna use like a highlighter ink or something and make them like, why, I can't even read this. Um, but yeah, unless you really are trying to have that effect. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, really just broaden your own horizons, try some different stuff, try just using it, just commit to say like, okay, like your apricot, for example, all right, this is, I'm gonna ink it up in this pen, I'm gonna use it until I stop. Uh, until I run out of ink and see, you might find after a day or two, it really starts to grow on you. There's gonna be aspects of it. It might shine a certain way in a certain light, or it may be, oh man, when, it, when I look at the shading, it really makes a difference. Or honestly, sometimes I've had this. Um, when I'm taking quick little jotting notes, I like to have really, um, punchy, really saturated ink. But when I'm writing a really long page, especially on like a bright white paper, I don't want a really bright ink because it is a little harsher to read. Um, I want a more subtle ink. 
to use, you know? So I might actually change the hue or the, the saturation of the ink that I'm using based on whether or not it's something, if I'm gonna write a long letter to someone, um, the readback is gonna be a little nicer if it's a more subtler ink tone than it will be if it's this big, bright, punchy ink. Whereas if you're, say, taking notes in a, in a side of a book or if you're um, taking notes on a pre-printed program of some kind and it's already filled with a bunch of text, you might something want something really bright and poppy for your own notation. So there's all kinds of cool things that you can do to experiment with that. I think you can have some fun. All right, this question is from Andrew T on Facebook. I know you have a lot of inks. Have you written with all of the ones that you own? Do you set inks aside for special occasions? Do you collect ink for the sake of the collection or do you always intend to write with it? Uh, so I would say, you know, one of the cool things about ink specifically, uh, aside from pens, you know, if you look at a pen like, oh, I'm gonna save up, I'm gonna get a Homo sapiens and it's gonna be $500 and that's a lot of money. Um, you're not gonna be buying those a lot. You know, to have a pen collection, especially once you really fall deep into the rabbit hole and you, you know, a $150 pen, $60 pen is not anything that freaks you out uh, like any other hobby that you get deep into uh, is, it can get pretty expensive. So you might buy a couple of pens a year or something like that and, it, and that's cool. But the nice thing about ink is it's a lot cheaper. And so you can change out your inks constantly, you know, you can enjoy your pens, you can save up, get your, you know, holy grail pens, and then you can buy a bunch of different types of ink and really change up your experience quite a lot. So when I first got into the whole fountain pen thing, I didn't really prioritize the pen that much at all. I really got into the ink. So I have been building an ink collection from like day one, you know, so I have, an embarrassingly large ink collection, personal ink collection. Uh, of course, we have all the inks that we have here. I don't have one of everything set aside personally, um, but I definitely have a pretty significant collection. Uh, and I brought it out in Q&A before, and it was like, even I was kind of shocked as to how many I have. I need to like catalog all the inks I have, but that's like a project I can't even handle right now. Um, I would estimate I have somewhere around 200 bottles of ink personally, um, which is a lot. Now, some of the inks that I end up kind of collecting um, I don't know if this would be considered special occasions, but it's definitely the stuff that's like, okay, I know that Lamy is coming out with these special edition inks that uh, are going to run out. As soon as they release, I'm like, as a retailer, I know they're going to run out and uh, they're not gonna be around forever. So yes, I wanna have them. Yes, I might use them, but I'm not going to use them and use them and use them and use them and use them because then they're gonna be used up and then I will not have them anymore. So I'm a bit of a hoarder anyway, personally, in very specific aspects of my life. Other things I'm totally fine, but when it comes to things like books or Legos or, <laughs> you know, pen stuff, I'm a bit of a hoarder. Um, other things I don't, I don't latch onto so much, but I definitely am weird in certain ways. Um, when, even when it comes to like, I'm a woodworker, I don't ever like to throw any wood out uh, I like to use every bit of scrap of wood that I possibly can. So I have like piles of wood in my garage and stuff like that. Anyway, um, but yeah, I will definitely set aside specific special inks like this. And I guess kind of by default, that makes me a collector of sorts, but it's not really that focused. It's I'm more of an acquirer. Um, really, since I've been a retailer, when special edition inks have come out like this, I'm like, oop, yep, gotta have one of those and I'll hang on to it for posterity. You know, I've got other things like the Pelican comes out with an ink of the year and I will collect them every time they come out with an ink of the year, you know, and I don't use them very often. I really don't. I might use it when it first comes out because I want to get to know it, but then ongoing, I'm not really using it super regularly because I actually have um, a whole other set of inks down in my ink drawer here that's kind of just normal everyday inks. You know, my Oroshizuku Kanpeki, Liberty's Elysium, Noodler's Black, Lamy Turquoise, Daimy Marine, it's a lot of blues, actually. I'm kind of a blue freak, but um, when it comes to using just everyday inks, I will have the everyday inks that are regularly available that I love and know, and, and I will default to those. Um, I also have a lot that I'm trying out. I'll sample things all the time, or other folks on our team, as new inks come out, um, they're trying them out, and I'll use it, and stuff like that. Um, there'll be some stuff that'll come out in like a one-shot deal, like this Noodler's uh, Suffragist Carmine uh, was a recent thing. It was a one, a one uh, case kind of deal, uh, and I definitely was like, mm, I'm gonna keep one of those. 
Um, so I'll definitely get into this kind of thing where it becomes uh, a little more of a collection. Um, so I'm not writing with these regularly. But uh, this would be more of like collecting for the sake of the collecting. Um, but other inks certainly I will use purely for the intention of being able to uh, use it regularly. But I will say I only have one bottle of ink that have ever actually gone through, uh, which was a bottle of three ounce Noodler's Black. So that's the only ink that I've ever used enough to even need to replace it. So I would say that I probably could use my special inks more and uh, and I would not run out because you really need to use the same ink for quite a while to actually run out of it. 50 milliliters of ink actually lasts a pretty long time. Anywho, that about covers that. Let's talk some business questions, shall we? After I take a sip of water. Ah, I am doing No Shave November too, by the way. And uh, I'm getting getting now past the point where it's getting itchy. But uh, definitely not a power through for the next few days probably. I had to shave the neck a couple of times already because the neck, that's where it gets so unbelievably itchy for me. Anywho, let's talk business questions. I got a couple of them. Wendy L on Facebook asked, uh, this is more of a question for your customer care group. Have they ever gotten to work and changed the color of ink in their pen simply because they were not in the mood to write out long ink names on all the personal notes that they send with the orders? An example would be choosing Noodler's Blue over Noodler's Black Swan and Australian Roses. Love your company. Well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, yes, I had to laugh a little bit because I've done, you know, a fair share of handwritten notes myself uh, back in the more back in the early days. Um, but I got a whole team of folks that are writing these notes. Um, we do a, a note on every order and have been doing so for seven years. Um, but as you can guess, some ink names are more complicated than others. And you know, I say this in jest, like, yes, okay, my team does have to take that into account when they're writing these notes because some of these names are just very long and it takes kind of a surprising amount of time when you have to write it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and you know, keep in mind, they're servicing you guys as customers in a lot of different ways and writing out ink names is one very small way that that's happening and they have to be prudent with how they spend all their time in the way that they service. So, you know, they they do use inks with some longer names and stuff like that, especially if it's a newer thing or they're getting questions about it and they'll, they'll do that. But a lot of times they'll use that more for their own personal notation or they'll write some notes with it at a time when we're a little slower and have some buffer space for that. But if it's like, you know, we're not open on the weekends, so Monday morning rolls around, it's like, time to burn through them um, you know because we gotta we can't we can't ship the orders out until those notes are written right but uh, you know they'll do that especially if we have like a major release like you know Lamy Dark Lilac when that came out it was a flood of orders came in at once and we didn't want to hold people up because of how long it would take to write the notes so we'll abbreviate the notes sometimes and we'll definitely be like okay everybody it's uh it's launch time here, let's go to Lamy Blue or you know Noodler's Red or something like that. Let's not choose Black Swan and Australian Roses or uh, Rower and Klinger Leap Zieger Schwartz or something like that. You know, it's like they definitely have to take into account some of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we call that like our threat level midnight uh, time when we have to do that. But uh, you know, that definitely they, they like to play around with a bunch of stuff, but they, they certainly have to take some time into consideration there. Um, they've even experimented at times with abbreviating things like instead of saying black swan Australian roses they say like BSAR which if you're in the fountain pen world and you're looking at it online all the time and that's kind of common lingo that may make sense but we have to be careful about how much we're abbreviating stuff on our notes because somebody might get it and be like what in the world is N.BSAR they have no idea what that means. And so it's like, okay, that kind of defeats the purpose of even writing anything if they don't know what it is that we're writing. Um, so we have to kind of tone it back and have certain like, you know, uh, commonly understood abbreviations that we use on our ink names and stuff like that. Um, but it's kind of funny. Um, but uh, you know, bottom line is they want to get to know the inks and stuff like that. But at the same time, they, have, they don't want to slow it down so much. So it'll depend on the situation, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something they have to take into account. All right, this question is for Travis W. on Facebook. Some questions about products. What happened to bottled Coeco ink? 
and banded Apple notebooks. And do you ever plan to carry more Pelican pens? Um, sure. So this, uh, these pens, uh, not the pens, but the, the ink and the notebooks and stuff, this falls into uh, a category of products that we have that just frankly don't really sell that much um, for a variety of reasons. You know, sometimes for whatever reason, products don't sell. And you know, anyone who's in any retail business or you run your own business or whatever, you know, especially if it's a product-based business, man, inventory will bog you down. It will tie up all your cash. It will fill up all your shelves. You know, it'll fill up anytime you're trying to do any type of analysis about your products. It makes things complicated. You look at our website, we have 3,700 different products or so on our site. And you know, if there's a thousand extra products of things that really aren't popular or don't sell well, it's not really serving you as a customer very well to see a bunch of things that you know you're not gonna want. Of course, it's always difficult because we don't know what everybody's gonna want. For the most part, you know, we try to guess, but we don't really know how something's gonna take off until we are actually selling it. So sometimes we'll launch things, you know, Coeco Inc. was a good example of something that came out. We didn't know what demand there would be. It was kind of an expensive ink and we carried it for a little bit, like nobody bought it or very few people bought it. Um, there were just a lot of good alternatives that were a much lower price and different bottle shape and stuff like that. Didn't really sell, so we discontinued it and stopped carrying it. So it just, frankly, it just wasn't really missed that much. So we stopped carrying it. Now, of course, there's always you know gonna be the individual who's like, this is the one ink I've been looking for all my life and you stopped carrying it and it's like, I'm really sorry, but you are the one person last year that bought that ink. I just can't keep carrying it. It just doesn't make sense for me to do that. It's not prudent for me as a business owner to do that. So we have to be somewhat diligent about that. Um, Banded Apple Notebooks specifically. So Banded Apple is a very small retailer. They're out, um, uh, based in Asia and they uh, had uh, made these. There's no US distributor for these notebooks. So they, we were in direct contact with them. We were carrying them for a while. They wanted to undergo a redesign. So they basically stopped making the previous version of their notebooks and they told us we're gonna redesign them. It's gonna take a year or two for that to happen. And we were like, okay. So the products that we had on our site were the old version. We didn't really know what the redesign was gonna be, but we knew it was gonna look different. So we couldn't really leave the products up on our site that we had for the next year or two because it wasn't even gonna look the same. So, you know, and the popularity of Banded Apple was so-so. You know, the, they were an alternative to Midori notebooks to put into the Traveler's notebooks. Um, and, you know, so basically they, they stopped the supply. We, um, we sold out the stock that we had and we just decided we weren't gonna leave it up on the site if it was gonna be that long before you know, it, had, it was gonna come back. But basically by the time they were gonna come back, we would have to kind of re-promote it all over again as a whole new brand, basically. Um, and then in that time, Midori came out with some new stuff. We were able to carry our own Goulet notebooks, you know, and there were just, uh, Lloyd's term really kind of took off and we just had a lot of other kind of good notebook alternatives and uh, just wasn't as much of a hole to fill in terms of the Midori refills and stuff like that. So um, I, I, at the time, it wasn't that long ago at the time they were like, okay, we're gonna start ramping back up a little bit. We were like, well, I don't know. We might have to hold off on this. You know, just there wasn't a lot of brand recognition, wasn't a whole lot of demand, wasn't as much of a hole to fill in the marketplace for that type of notebook. So they're kind of on ice right now for us, you know. So um, it's something that we're, we're open to possibly in the future, but it hasn't, you're kind of like the first person that's asked me about it in a long time. Um, but uh, you know, it's just things like that can happen. Supply dries up, designs change, demand shifts, and we just have to make, you know, sound business decisions as to what we feel makes the most sense. And sometimes I completely understand it can be really confusing as a customer why certain things disappear because it's like we'll have other people you know you'll you'll look at a site and we'll not have something but somebody else will and you know it's, it's, it's different retailers have different stock levels it takes a different amount of time to clear stuff and so it can be kind of confusing as to why we don't have something or why we used to but don't anymore and honestly like sometimes when we are discontinuing something we do it kind of quietly because we don't want to make a big stink about it um, especially if we don't really have a lot or if something is discontinued and we're not, you know half the time what happens when a product is discontinued or changed or, or runs out of stock or something like that we don't get any notice of it it's when we go to reorder our stock level gets really low we go to reorder and then they say 
oh yeah, okay, well, the, this is out now. And uh, actually we just t were told from the manufacturer that they're not gonna make this anymore. And it's like, okay, well we have like two left. So it just kind of goes on, it sells out and it's like, okay, well that's gone now. If it's a big deal and it's really gonna be missed, we might put a blog post about, out about it or something like that saying like, hey, this is gone now. But half the time it's like a color of a pen that hasn't really been popular anyway. And it just, you know, it kind of quietly just goes away. So you'll you'll then like stumble upon a blog post or I'll have a QA and a where I mentioned it, you know, a year ago and you'll stumble upon it and you'll be like, whatever happened to this? And that's usually what happens is demand just kind of wanes and all that. Um, as to Pelican pens that you're talking about here, um, the Pelican uh, stuff is, is really like elusive to me. So like we've done really hit or miss with Pelican pens in the past. We get asked about them a lot. You know, the Suvron series, the M200s on up through the thousands, we get asked about them a lot. And we've special ordered them at times in the past. We're not currently taking special orders for Pelican pens now, partly because um, it's probably like a 30 to 1 ratio for inquiries we get versus people that actually want to special order them um, because the price <laughs> uh, for a lot of them. But uh, also it has to do with availability. Like we've we've gone to special order stuff. There's a huge number of SKUs of Pelican because there's all these different sizes that are very hard to distinguish from each other unless you're really into the Pelican stuff. So unless we're like really fully carrying it regularly, it's hard to kind of really promote and distinguish all the different sizes. Um, but uh, there's all these different colors and finishes and the nib sizes too. So there's a huge number of SKUs for Pelican. So to try to stock it is really difficult. And when we have gone to special order in the past, it's really hit or miss as to whether we can get something. And we've done special, we've taken special orders before and like four to six months goes down the road. And it's like, look, this hasn't come in yet. We're gonna have to cancel this order because we don't wanna hang on to your money for forever and just have this hanging out and forever. You know, it's just, it creates a kind of a logistical thing. So we don't really do that anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really elusive. And, and especially with a brand like that, that the pens are, are pretty good price range. Uh, really get up there pretty good, especially the 800s and the 1000s, uh, that then it's like, okay, color, nib size, all that kind of stuff. How in the world do we know what's really going to sell well? And then when you get spotty stock and stuff like that, it can get, get, can get kind of challenging. So we haven't really nailed down how to carry Pelican yet, personally. So it's something that I would love to figure out, um, but it's just something that, uh, well, one thing that we have had good success with recently, at Goulet at least, is um, you know limited editions, special editions, that kind of thing. Because there's usually like one big shipment of that comes in, it's pretty well defined, we can place our order, get it in, and then it kind of goes and we don't have to worry about reordering and stuff. But uh, you know, I think it's just in the global marketplace, I think the US is not really like the big growth future part of the world in terms of fountain pens. That may shock you, but I think Asia is a much more growing market um, for these global brands like Lamy and Pelican and some of these. Um, Asia presents much more of an opportunity, so I think just in general, globally probably, and I'm very much generalizing here, so take all of this with a grain of salt, but I believe that more of the focus of new stock and things like that ends up going towards the higher growth areas, and then sometimes we get kind of the leftovers and stuff like that, so um, it can be some a little hit or miss, because you know, there's only, you know, a brand, especially if it's a brand that's growing a pretty significant amount, you know, it takes a while to increase production and you have to literally like add on to your factory and increase machines and stuff like that. So sometimes there's only a certain number of pens that can be made in a given year. And uh, I know that was an issue with Pilot with their Kakuno for a while. Now granted, this is an expensive pen, uh, but they did not bring this pen into the US for like two years because they just did not have the production capacity to be able to offer it. Same thing, it was the, that way with the uh, Pilot Vanishing Point in the extra fine nib. It came out in Japan and then it was like, a while went by, and the stub nibs too, before they were able to offer it in the US because there just wasn't enough production capacity to be able to do it. So we run into that sometimes a little bit with Pelican um, specifically, is I think that uh, you know sometimes the stock just isn't there reliably, and for us trying to get into it without having reliable stock, it's really like it's spinning your wheels in the mud sometimes as a retailer to try to do that. So uh, last question for this week, and then we'll t and then we'll we'll pack it up. This is one, one Shub H on Instagram, if I said that right, forgive me. Um, with online retail becoming stronger in the fountain pen and stationary universe, 
and with a growing set of users across the world, what do you think are the next set of challenges for Google Pens or online retail as well as the manufacturers? Will being more local become a priority or is being global the way to go? Okay, these are very big, huge questions that you have here. And uh, I would imagine that if I was one of my competitors, I would watch this question closely to see what I, what's, what's gonna come out of my mouth. I took some notes here, but I may stray a little bit, but nothing here that I say will probably be incredibly shocking. Um, yes, I would say that online is the way to go because uh, that's what I've done. Uh, I put my money where my mouth is on that one. So um, I think, you know, Goulet Pens, we have 41 people here in our company now. Um, we represent an, an opportunity for growth in an online space for a physical niche good like fountain pens. Um, now, that said, I've also seen a number of online retailers that have come and gone over the seven years that we've been in business. So, you know, I wouldn't say that it's like just going online means you're going to be a booming success. There's obviously a lot that has to be done right. Um, I do think that there's, you know, probably more opportunity to do it because you have a global market, but there's also a lot of challenges too, which you brought up. So um, I think that uh, there's some advantages to being a local store. Like I think about some of the challenges that I run into as an online retailer. Um, when I am with someone in person and I hand them the pen and it's like, oh yeah, like you can visualize, it's like trying on clothes in the store versus trying to buy them online. It's just a very different experience. Um, you know, when I give somebody a pen to write with, they can see the ink, they feel it on the paper. Man, that does so much to really try to, to sell it for you. You know what I mean? Like you get sold on that much easier, you know, versus just being told about it or reading about it online or watching a video, you know, there's a lot of things like this that I try to do to compensate for the fact that you're not physically in possession of the product. So that is a challenge, certainly with online. Um, and then specifically with like, you know, tweaking and testing and repair and, you know, nib tuning and like all these different things that can be done from a service standpoint, a lot of that's so much easier to do in store, in a, per, in a person, in person in a store. Can't speak English right now. Um, but uh, that's definitely one, uh, one huge factor with, um, you know, a physical store. Um, but the reality is in a niche like fountain pens, um, there's just not enough people really in much of any locality these days to support a physical store. Now, the physical stores that I've seen that have had really good success are either in major metropolitan areas, New York, DC, Dallas, you know, LA, stuff like that. Um, where there's just so many people that they can probably support, you know, uh, a community like that. I mean, even in Richmond here, we're just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Um, we had a Paradise Pen here that recently closed down its doors. Um, that was like the one, you know, real decent pen store that was in our area, um, aside from, you know, us. But I'm talking like a physical stationary store. We don't have a physical store here. Um, but like in terms of a physical pen store, that was kind of it. There's a couple like small like stationary shops that might have a few pens, but it's not a, really a pen store. So that's there's really nothing even in our local area here. So it's just like, and, and Richmond's not a small city by any means, you know, five, 600,000 people. So it's uh, it's just tough. It's tough because you're, you're getting so niche into people's interest that it just is not easy to support in a local area. Now the, the companies I've seen have either been in a major area or they've been in uh, a hybrid. So they'll do a local thing, uh, a local brick and mortar store because that's kind of their passion and that's that's totally respectable. Um, but then they'll have an online presence as well. And so that's kind of the best of both worlds and that undoubtedly comes with its own challenges. Or they might do like the pen show circuit and have an online presence and stuff like that. Um, that's a challenge because you have multiple focuses and different ways of servicing that you're trying to do in, at the same time. That becomes its own challenge, um, but certainly that that helps, right? Um, and plus every every uh, retailer that I can think of that has a physical presence, it's not exclusively fountain pens. There's a lot of roller balls and stuff that are a part of that as well. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, didn't get a lot of notice on that sneeze either. So um, being an online store, so um, let me talk about that for a second because I have, you know, basically, um, you know, looked to build uh, a company here that's an online company that sells a very physical, tangible product. Um, but I have tried to take all of the best elements that I could with what makes a local uh, store great, such as you think about like 
knowing the market really well, knowing your products really well, being really vested in in that, you know, your your product, knowing you know product knowledge, knowing the community really well, having that sense of personal welcoming, um, you know, nature to it. Um, I think about like some of the small local stores that I knew kind of growing up as a kid. Um, and there's definitely that like family kind of feel to it. Um, that as uh, we were setting up Goulet Pens in the very beginning, Rachel and I, um, you know, there was Amazon and some other like big kind of thing. And it was all like dot com this and, you know, kind of this was after the dot com bust. But, um, you know, a lot of what was happening, this is in late 2008, early 2009, as I was looking at online stores and we had built one for, before we started selling fountain pens, we were selling my handmade pens online. There were so many companies out there that were using websites to kind of mask their personality. So they would be an individual or a small group that would try to seem a lot bigger than they were just because they were online. And I looked at that and I was like, this seems crazy to me. Like, why would you try to seem like a big corporate entity? And I guess it seems like to some degree you want to seem professional and stuff like that because it gives you credibility in some circles. Um, but in terms of like a niche like this, I was like, that doesn't make sense for me at all. You know, and I never wanted to be one of those people that was like, a single person that was always saying we this and we that I'm like you know there's other companies that I'll see where it's like I'll follow somebody on Twitter and I'll know it's just them doing their thing but then when I go to their website it's all we this we that we the one I'm like why are they saying we this and we that when it's not a we it's a me you're like make it personal man like use your strength like that's a strength to me that's not hey I'm your one man show and you've got a lot of personality into it use that you know what I mean don't try to mask it and make it a corporate gig anyway that is a bit of a tangent. So that's what I wanted to do with Goulet Pens. It was always about, you know, you get to know me and I get to know you and we're the community and this is it. And I'm plugged into the community and I have accountability within the community because it's my name and it's my face that you're seeing. Like to me, that always seemed like the way to go. And then, so that is the same kind of thing like physical store. You have that, you walk in, you're face to face with that individual and it's very like, you're accountable. Same kind of thing that I wanted to have. So I take, I, I viewed taking the best of what a physical store could be and translate that to online. And there's a lot of advantages to having online. So, you know, just the, the speed that you can have in terms of growing, in terms of um, you know social media and communication and effectiveness, and you can use cloud-based services instead of having to you know physically have structure in your building, uh, and just things like that. You know, um, being able to shoot a video like this and have it shared out and watched over and over and over again. Like there's a multiplication effect that happens with that. So I can shoot video after video after video after video and it's published out there in the world and I don't have to say, actually say the same thing over and over and over again, it's on video. You know, that's a, that was a huge, huge, you know, aha moment for me in the early days. Um, so, you know, that's some of the advantages. Now, you asked me about the challenges of being online. Um, you know, some of the bigger challenges that people don't realize is there is a very significant expense to being online that uh, is pretty close to a brick and mortar store. A lot of people, and it's not it's something I've heard about as much in recent years, but especially earlier on, we would hear some griping from some of the brick and mortar stores about saying like, oh, they're an online retailer. They don't have the same expenses we have of retail storefront and salespeople and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, that may be true, but I have web developers. I have, you know, uh, an online store with the bandwidth and stuff that you can imagine comes from a store our size that costs as much as a retail storefront. We have a physical warehouse and office space and we have, you know, designers and web people and photographers and like all this, like we have, a lot of the same overhead that a physical brick and mortar store does definitely probably not as much as if you were in like you know midtown manhattan or something like that but even still there's the significant uh expense to operating an online business um so that's definitely something that is an issue that um that may not seem like as much of it unless you think about it uh, a bit or have some experience with it 
um, the globalization of the marketplace has become an issue. It's Yes, there's boundless opportunities when you go online, but there's also boundless opportunities for everybody else in the world. So, you know, they get a monster like Amazon or, you know, other retailers, other niche retailers, somebody who's got an amazing amount of talent and depth and knowledge of something that props up, that crops up from, you know, somewhere anywhere in the world that can be your competitor online. You know, you're not dealing with just in your local area trying to be the big, the big fish in a small pond. You're not playing in the big pond. You got to be a big fish in a big pond. So um, you got to really make sure that you are truly world-class talent if you want to be, you know, really successful on the world stage, which is when anyone who gets on the internet, you're at a global stage pretty much. Um, so that's definitely a challenge, keeps you on your toes. Um, and then the other thing is just, um, you know, the, the logistics of shipping things and transacting globally has not kept up with the speed of information. So for example, you can read a blog from somebody that just bought a pen in the Philippines and they posted a review on it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's perfect, I want that pen. And you look online, you're like, why can't I find this pen anywhere? Well, it's because it's only available in that area. And or you go and you, it's like they talk about how much it costs here, but then by the time it gets to a different country, it's like two or three times the price. And you're like, what is going on here? It's because you get all kinds of taxes and export and import fees and shipping costs and lead times and all this stuff that it's just the, the legal kind of stuff of transferring goods from one country to another is definitely more archaic than the speed of you know video and blogs and all this kind of stuff so you as a re as a as a consumer get really excited about wanting something but then there's a whole mess of logistics that sometimes even I as a retailer don't understand why some things take as long as they do um, just because you're dealing with government entities and just you know archaic kind of structures that are not keeping up with how fast everything is changing in the world. And that's just like, that's an issue for everybody, not just specific to fountain pens, uh, but that definitely can be uh, a thing. I think another issue um, is for manufacturers uh, and what they deal with is having an increasingly difficult time with things like gray markets and fakes and you know just unpredictable global demand that happens because the, the um, you know, the buying patterns globally are just much harder to kind of wrap your arms around, especially if you're a relatively small company uh, as a manufacturer. You know, I think some of these Italian companies, even like Visconti, there's not that many people that work there. It's a handful. I bet, you know, I bet our company here at 41 is bigger than, you know, certainly than most of the Italian pen makers and their companies, but it's bigger than a fair number of other manufacturers um, at this point. They're just, you know, they use a lot of machinery and stuff. They're very efficient with their work, but in terms of like overhead and people and the resources they have there, um, they're not that huge sometimes. And uh, to try to spend the time to understand globally what's going on, it's just so much to wrap your head around. I mean, it takes large companies um, that have a lot of resources and stuff like that to really be able to understand the global demand. A lot of other times it's just like, you know, something will just really take off in one area of the country and whoosh, all the demand will suck it up and then it's like everywhere else in the world is out of stock. You know what I mean? And so then they try to ramp up their manufacturing, but then, you know, some other competitor comes along and, you know, it's just like everything is just at such a bigger, bigger stage, which presents a lot of opportunity, you know, for those manufacturers that are really able to keep up with that demand. But otherwise, it's really elusive sometimes to try to understand where the demand is coming from because the speed of information and everybody is so much access to so many different things now that it's no longer just you go into a store and you have your options and that's kind of it based on your local area. Now it's anyone in the world essentially can have access to almost any products in the world that they want to a degree and that's, uh, that just creates um, you know, a great opportunity but also a great challenge for any manufacturer to really kind of stand out and be recognized and, and get a good momentum you know, demand for their products and stuff like that. So. Um, that is, uh, is certainly, certainly a thing. Um, but you know, we're talking about challenges and stuff like that. I don't think it's anything that isn't uh, able to be overcome. I just think it's just, you know, this is kind of the new world order in terms of e-commerce and what's going on. I think it's just, this is just normal business stuff. Um, a lot of companies have been around for a long time are adapting and learning, um, having to shift and transition. And there's definitely a, a movement of that. 
Um, the vast majority of, of uh, retailing is still happening offline, but I think for a niche industry like fountain pens, there is a hard shift right now to going online just because of the access of information, the availability that you have to find these very specific products that you want that are not um, at scale to be offered in your local area. I think that's uh, going to be more of a trend in uh, the future. And uh, the pace of uh, business that's changing is faster than I think it ever has been in history, if you really think about it. You know, the amount of change that happens in even a five or a 10 year span is staggering when you think about you know, all of human history. It's really amazing how fast things are changing. Um, I think there's also more opportunity than there's ever been. So um, it's a really exciting time to be in, uh, you know, the fountain pen world, I think. It's also an exciting time to be in business and just be uh, even an observer, a consumer in business. It's a, it's a very interesting place to be. So that's my thoughts on that. I, will, I could talk about this kind of stuff all day and I'll just kind of stop pontificating and let you uh, go back to your real life here. Uh, my question of the week for this week is, what is your special occasion ink? Or do you have one? You know, do you have any type of rhythm or pattern to your, your ink usage? And if so, do you have any one like special ink that you kind of only save for certain times or something like that? I'd be curious if you could elaborate on that for me a little bit. Um, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. You can check out a lot of what I talked about here on GoulayPens.com, my site. Um, you can also uh, leave comments on YouTube or on the blog. Uh, I will always love uh, seeing your feedback and uh, what you think about how I'm doing here. Uh, I hope you are going to have a great weekend and a great rest of your week. And right on.